So this could be a, a good video, an interesting video and possibly a very popular video because of today I've got the Acer Aspire V5. Now this V5 has been out for a year uh, but this is a brand new version, new design and the first with an AMD Timash processor in. So that's the A6 1450 in here, quad core. So 11.6 inch, 1.38 kilos, it's looking like an ultrabook, it's feeling like an ultrabook. And it should have performance in that sort of category as well. It may not be the fastest, but we're expecting the graphics to be pretty good. Uh, it has a hard drive in it, but it's very easy to upgrade this to an SSD. That's one of the things we'll be doing with this. And the other thing is price. 450 euros I've just paid for this, which uh, for those of you who don't work in euros is cheaper than any Ultrabook. And because this has a touchscreen, Windows 8, and, and a reasonably powerful uh, processor, it's actually... Uh, looking like a very good value device. Of course, we've got a test battery life, keyboard, etc., etc. But let's dive into it and have a look around the device and uh, uh, give you some first impressions. So, let's see if we can get this uh, out pretty swiftly. Acer Aspire V5122P is the model number. This is a German version. So, obviously, bought in Germany. Right there. Right, let's just check we've got exactly what we think we've got. So there's the new design, you can see that V5 touch here. And let's just check on the side. And we do have a quad core A6-1450 in there. Right, let's just uh, open it up then. And uh, give you a real quick, uh, quick look around the device. So I did some theoretical testing on the V5 based on some numbers that were floating around. Clock for clock, the A61450 should be the same as an Ivy Bridge processor, but this is running at 1 gigahertz and not 1.8, like you'll find some of the Core i5 Ultrabooks. Having said that, it's got a turbo boost to 1.4 gigahertz. So it's going to make it very interesting because the graphics power should be at least as good as the Ivy Bridge HD4000. Ultrabooks. So there's your power pack there, standard stuff, basic packaging, nothing exciting, and uh, that matches the price of the device really. Right, let's have a look. Right, so we've got a plastic, reasonably good looking silverized finish, and uh, feels very plasticky on the bottom. I'm immediately looking for access ports but this is this one you'll have to take the whole of the base off to change the change the SSD this is an in interesting and important feature that is where an additional battery clips in there's only a 30 watt hour battery inside this but there's a couple of location screw holes there and this allows an extra battery to be bought and uh, and popped in there so that's that's a really interesting feature because it allows you to if you want expand the battery life right let's open it up have a look inside feeling a little bit plasticky not feeling completely ultrabook like in terms of finish it's definitely sort of cheap plastic there uh, certainly doesn't look bad the design's quite smooth i like this little uh, ledge that you've got at the back there big touchpad single unit actually feels not too bad in terms of buttons on the bottom left bottom right uh, keyboard is actually backlit and that's um, well that's something we'll have to test a bit further it's not immediately the best feedback I've had on, on, a, on a keyboard but it's certainly not uh, not too bad and the white on black uh, gives a good contrast on the keys but it is black lit backlit so uh, not too much of a problem there screen is touch screen 3066 by 768 which on 11.6 screen is not too much not too bad sorry it's uh, you know you wouldn't really want uh, full HD on this uh, screen or you don't really need full HD on this size screen 4 gigs of RAM in here 500 gig hard drive as I mentioned, the AMD TMash 1450 quad core at 1 gigahertz. Let's have a look at the ports. Kensington port lock, USB 3. Now, this is an important one. It looks like a display port, but in fact, it's an adapter port, which allows you to break out VGA, USB, and what was the other one? I can't remember what the other one was now. I think um, I'll have to look in the box for the, for the cable. There's the 
SD card slot. So nice to see that. On the other side, USB, power button, and a headset button, and the DC there as well. So nothing else. Speaker ports on the bottom, left, right, nothing on the back. Just diving back into the box to see if I can find the cable, adapter cable. Uh, not part of the package, which is actually pretty disappointing. I'm looking again and again. No, it's not part of the package. That's quite disappointing because you've actually got a device here without any video output. That's really weird. So um, we'll have to double check on that one. Maybe the, the, the cable was supposed to be delivered with it because I've never ha ever had a device without any video out component to it. It certainly doesn't say that the cable is supplied on the um, on the box. Anyway, right. Let's uh, let's switch this on. See if there's any juice in it. Maybe you have to give that a little bit of a boost with some mains power before it comes on. Let's do that right now. So we've got the power cable in there, and in the box I've just found this. And if you can read that, it says Acer converter cable optional. Here you can see the picture of what it actually does. So you've got LAN, USB, and VGA out on there. Assuming that's going to cost you $20, add that to the price of the, the notebook because it's uh, without any sort of video output if you haven't got this adapter. Right, let's switch this, uh, switch this on now. You can see the backlit keyboard is lit up there. And this is first boot on Windows 8, so of course it'll take a little bit longer than normal. And, um, well, that boots though, just doing some checking of viewing angles. Just a little bit of fading there, no inversion. Uh, in theory, this is an IPS screen, but as you can see, there is a little bit of fading there. Um, but certainly better than a standard, uh, standard screen. Right, let's let that boot up, and uh, we'll get going and even run a couple of tests for you. Okay, it's up. That took about 10 minutes to get through the whole uh, Windows 8 uh, process. While I was typing, um, I didn't find any major issues with the keyboard or the, or the mouse, but we'll do some more testing on that in a bit. Let's um, take a look at the um, computer details here. System details. Show. Difficult to see maybe on the screen there. AMD A6 1450 APU with Radeon HD graphics, 1 gigahertz, 4 gigs of RAM on this, a 64 bit operating system. And we've got a 500 gig hard drive in, it, in here, so it's not an SSD. Um, so, what I'm going to do, and I think the first most important test that's going to give me an idea of the performance here is Cinebench uh, version 11.5. Five, I think that is that I use. What we'll do is we'll run the Cinebench graphics and CPU tests and see what we get. So we've got uh, Cinebench 11.5 installed. We've got it on battery power, balanced mode, and we're going to go for the uh, CPU test. So let's kick that off now and uh, come back to you with the results. So in terms of CPU performance, the A6 1450 at 1 GHz, and it was running at 1 GHz all the way through that. I didn't see any turbo boost, 0.85 points. So in terms of absolute values, this is uh, about a third of the CPU processing power of a standard Core i5 1.8 GHz Ultrabook. Normalized in terms of performance per clock, uh, it's actually on par, as we expected, with uh, Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge uh, CPUs. So this does have the potential to go higher. If this could boost to 2 GHz, you'd have Ultrabook performance, but it doesn't. Absolute terms, about a third of the uh, processing power of a Core i5 1.8 GHz Ultrabook. Now let's test the OpenGL scores. So it shouldn't take too long to run through this uh, test, so I'll leave this one running. Uh, on Ultrabooks, we're getting up to, I think, around 15 frames. 
Um, just looking at some old results. Maximum scores you get on Ultrabooks is about 15 frames a second. On Sandy Bridge we were getting around half that, 8 frames a second. Now this is the Radeon 8, uh, 8280G. So let's see how it does. Obviously the CPU is preparing the scene here. So this is actually taking a bit longer than normal to prepare the scene. Running through the OpenGL test itself, I'm expecting a reasonable score uh, at least up to the performance of an HD 4000. Let's see. So we just run that through and that was 8 frames a second which is about Sandy Bridge HD, HD 3000 performance under battery power. Now what I'm going to do now is plug the mains in and we'll run the test again because uh, under battery power the standard power profiles mean that the graphics are underclocked. So I'm going to run that again, it'll take, uh, take a minute. And then we'll uh, we'll see what sort of performance we get on that. So we're running it through a mains power now. Uh, certainly doesn't seem to be as smooth as what you'd find on an HD 4000 graphics. Uh, really, actually, not much better than uh, than on battery power. Let's see what the what the score is here. And that's finished. The score is. 8.53 so uh, under a 10% improvement there just for putting the mains power in so uh, what can we quickly put together from that uh, basically the, the CPU clock for clock is in the same range as the Ivy Bridge CPU so normalized clock for clock about the same sort of processing power in absolute terms about a third of the processing power of a Core i5 Ultrabook in terms of uh, graphics, you're looking at HD 3000 level graphics performance on this uh, Cinebench OpenGL test. Obviously, there's other tests that need to be done. Uh, but first impressions are that it's not up to the performance of an Ultrabook, a current Ultrabook with HD 4000. And certainly in the next two months when um, HD 5000 comes out with the Haswell processor, um, you'll be looking at about a, ooh, about a quarter of the performance of the 2013, late 2013 uh, Haswell Ultrabooks. So anyway, that's the first test there. Um, let me just run a couple more tests very quickly for you. So this is a crystal mark test. It's an old test, but it's a test I used to use for all netbooks uh, years ago. So it gives us uh, an idea of the performance of this compared to a netbook. Now a netbook would usually turn in around 25,000, maybe 30,000 if you're lucky. So we're up to si almost 60,000 here. So in terms of netbook performance comparison, this is about twice what you'd get out of a standard Atom dual core 1.6 gigahertz uh, netbook. So not bad. And if you think about and where it sits in the market because there is a space between the old netbook performance and what's coming now with 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 ultrabooks this is quite nicely positioned so with the backlight keyboard with the uh touch with the lightweight and the reasonably nice uh design uh it looks like we've got a good price uh, performance uh, ratio here a quick word on heat and noise that's something uh some of you might be uh thinking about now we've been running tests on this and the fan output is here there's not a lot of heat coming out of it at all actually and there's no real detectable heat across the top uh, and very very little across the back so uh, in terms of efficiency this could be quite interesting and i need to uh, check uh, battery life over a longer period but currently it looks like there's about three hours battery left on 81%. So for a 30 watt hour battery that's in this, um, that's actually looking pretty good. Uh, it would be interesting to see how big the external battery is and, and how much that adds to it. But if it's the same capacity as the internal one, it looks like you'll get a six to seven hour device uh, with the external battery, three hours with just the internal battery. So that's the unboxing and uh, first tests of the Acer Aspire V5 122P, the new design 
with the AMD TMash A61450 processor in there. Uh, first impressions are this is something that seems to be good value and sits very well between what was netbook performance and what is ultrabook performance today. So in terms of sort of lightweight touchscreen Windows 8 budget or high value uh, laptops, this is pretty good. And I think when we put an SSD in this, it's really gonna, uh, really gonna make it extremely snappy as well. The hard drive is probably the weakest link in this. In terms of performance though, in, in terms of absolute values, it's about a third of the CPU performance of a good ultrabook in first half of 2013. GPU performance about half what you get on AC4000. Compare that to netbooks and it's about 2x what you get from a netbook in terms of performance. So um, some potential there for doing some low-end gaming, not high-end gaming at all, but low-end gaming. Maybe even some 720p video editing could be possible on this, uh, but certainly media playback and just general office activity shouldn't be a problem. I like the build quality, although it is a little bit plasticky. Um, I would like to see access on the bottom. Good to see that you can put uh, an additional battery on this, but bad to see that they don't deliver the breakout point, which gives you the only possibility to get external video out on this. So that's uh, something you need to pay attention to. We'll be reviewing this on ultrabooknews.com over the next few weeks. The Acer Aspire V5122P, bought in Germany, and uh, I assume it's going to be available worldwide pretty soon. I think this is going to be a pretty good setup. Stay tuned for more info. My name's Chippy. Uh, don't forget to follow us on YouTube uh, on the channel. Uh, we're on Twitter, Ultrabook News, Facebook, Ultrabook News, and Google Plus, Ultrabook News. Thanks very much for watching. See you on the next video.